Hello everyone. We're here with Amit Verma. He is a writer, podcaster and the host of The Scene and the Unseen. So tell us Amit, what is the big idea you've been thinking about? I don't have so much a big idea as a, a big concern. And my big concern is really about the relationship between the state and the individual. And that's a balance that all countries suffer with, all, all countries wrestle with, all societies grapple with. And in India, unfortunately, since independence, it's been too much on the side of the state as opposed to the individual. And there are logical contextual reasons for this. You know, when we gained independence, um, you know, the country was falling apart, partition had happened. Uh, there was violence all across the country. The, the lines on the map weren't what they are today. It was all in flux. So you didn't know if the center would hold. So when you're sitting and drafting the constitution in Delhi at that point in time, uh, you know, it is logical to just make sure that you centralize power, that, uh, you know, you center power in the state and make sure that there isn't anarchy and everything doesn't fall apart. So I understand that. But a consequence of that is that we centralize power far too much. And that centralization was written into the design of the Indian constitution and plagues us to this day. The other thing that sort of happened, um, uh, which which is you know also part of a pervasive mindset that continues, is the distrust of markets. Now, again, this is sort of understandable. Number one, uh, part of what we had just managed to fight against and win against was colonialism, which came in through the East India Company. So there was this natural sort of understandable suspicion of companies, you know, and free markets conceptually then weren't as well understood as they are now. The fashion of the times was to valorize the Soviet Union. We didn't know much about, uh, you know, what was really going on uh, in there at that time. So again, the early directions that we took in terms of distrusting markets can be understood. Nehru, of course, was greatly influenced by Harold Lasky to the extent that John Kenneth Galbraith uh, once remarked that every time there's a cabinet meeting, uh, you know, there's an empty chair there for Sir Harald Lasky right. because, uh, you know, the great influence of the Fabian Socialists. And Nehru once famously said to J.R.D. Tata, do not speak to me of profit. Profit is a dirty word. And this became something that was not just embedded into the way uh, that the relationship between the state and society was designed, but it also became uh, a part of our mindsets. So, you know, so we came, uh, in one sense, that colonial construct carried over. That the state was not there to serve us in a vibrant democracy and so on. The state was there to rule us. We were the subjects. The state was a my buff. We had to look to it for everything. You know, uh, uh, pri private enterprise was individual enterprise. You know, society serving its own needs was frowned upon and curtailed. And the result of the this institutional design also led to certain pervasive mindsets. For example, you know, Jagdish Bhagwati once remarked that, hey, China has a profit-seeking mindset, India has a rent-seeking mindset. I think he said this more than 20 years ago. But I can't speak for China, but there's a germ of truth in it as far as India is concerned, uh, in the sense that a lot of people, when they think of, you know, starting a new enterprise, starting a business, their mindset is to exploit the other person. Like, uh, you know, how can I um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, scamming is something that people have actually aspired to in decades past. And for me, this mindset is not some something inherent within Indian culture. I think it is something that arises from our institutions, that when you have the state having all the power, and the only way to actually get some power yourself in a time of scarcity is either to be part of the state or is through the state as a crony, then you, you look at the world in that kind of zero-sum way where the only way you can get ahead is by making someone else worse off, that there's so uh, little in that pie to begin with. And this, this is part of our mindset. Also, I keep saying that our biggest religion is not Hinduism, it's a religion of government. For everything, we look to the government. Any problem that we have, oh, the government should step in and do this. And that's, again, pervasive, and it's easy to understand because that's pretty much all that we have known. And the consequence of our bad economic policies, the consequence of the way the Constitution was framed for, you know, to give us people who rule, you know, to build a class of... Uh, people who ruled us rather than serve us. The consequence of all of that is that uh, in the at the level of the real world, uh, you know, millions of people stayed in poverty for decades longer than necessary, uh, especially with Indira Gandhi making it far, far worse, where you cannot even give her the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, at least she had good intentions. Uh, she clearly didn't. She was, you know, a, a, a sociopath who turned leftward to consolidate power within the Congress party against the syndicate. And I would say that even before the emergency, 
um, you know, she ravaged the country. Her economic policies were a crime on humanity and again just perpetuated poverty for much longer than necessary. And we had a golden period after 91 for maybe about 20 years or so where there were reforms, where individual freedom came back. But they were in limited areas. Even then, they did a lot of good. They brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and that's fantastic. But there was a lot left to be done. But what did not change, by and large, was still this uh, essential mindset that, you know, this, the, the state is the center of everything. We are subjects. And that everything that can happen in society happens uh, in a centrally, di uh, centrally directed way. That essential truth uh, of someone like, say, Adam Ferguson, that what, whatever happens is the result of human action, not human design, is, you know, not ingrained yet. We still suffer from the engineering mindset. So, um, and I want to link it back to what you said on how there was a predilection towards maintaining order. And while that leads to the sense of the state is powerful and that led to the power construct, do you think it has also pervaded into the inability of um, Indian companies or people who aspire to do uh, enter into professions to not take risk? Do you see a lens of do you think that focus on the state maintaining order and everything that being reliant on the state has prevented us from having a risk-seeking mindset? Yeah, and I think that risk aversion uh, come that risk aversion is also ingrained. Like when I grew up in uh, the 80s, the, the common thing was stability. That's what you looked at. You know, getting into government service was uh, the, the biggest thing that could happen, and I, I don't mean just at the level of elites like me studying for the civil services, but also down the line. Like even today, where if there are 20 vacancies uh, for PN's uh, jobs, you'll have 40,000 applications out of which 2,000 will be PhDs. Now that, of course, speaks to, uh, you know, a mismatch in the demand and supply equation in the education to jobs market. But it also tells you that even a PN's job has a value even today because it gives you that stability. You have that job, you'll never be sacked. You know, we still live with those same insecurities. And I think when elites look around and they see the change that has happened around them in the cities and we are living really good lives, and it is true that there are, you know, the middle class expanded massively after 1991, but we don't realize how much work there is left to be done. And that absolutely breaks my heart. I think that is the one thing that keeps me up at night, that mindsets haven't changed. Even when we see evidence of the good that freedom can do and liberty can do, the mindsets haven't changed. We still look at the state as a Maibab Sarkar. We are still okay with it, uh, you know, centralizing power, with it being, uh, uh, with it interfering in dominions where it has no business interfering, having a chilling effect on what society could do. If the state just, like the Indian state really is vast and weak, whereas it should be limited and strong. If it was limited and if it was efficient at doing the few things it really should do, like the rule of law, which it isn't, but if it just focused on those and was good in those, then the rest of us could get ahead without fear of repri reprisal or the license raj or the, um, uh, uh, you know, tax terrorism to do our thing and to actually be profit seeking in that sense where the only way to make money becomes to make someone else's life better off. And unfortunately, that mindset is really far away. It is not there in the discourse. Uh, all the political parties are fundamentally oppressive, both in the economy and in the personal space. You know, they are extremely statist when it comes to economics. And even in the personal space, we are st still really far from liberal as a society. And all the parties, in a sense, are uh, similar. You know, some are worse than others in some margins, but they're all similar. And that's what kind of breaks my heart. And that's what makes me think that there is, there is still a second freedom struggle that needs to be formulated that needs to be fought uh, you know the job wasn't done in 1947 yeah and uh, it'd be good to hear your thoughts on i've seen this where in the absence of any existing structure there is an almost an instinct to say the default is the state as opposed to saying that look let people figure it out and if required the state must enter we almost seem to think that if there is any white space in any market the default is that the state must do it. do you ha do you think that have you seen it that is very much the case, and it is not just a cultural thing and an artifact of the way our state has been designed, but it is hardwired into us as human beings because we evolved in prehistoric times, we lived in tribes in times of scarcity, and you wanted a strong tribal leader, leader who is going to run things. You know, you did not have the scale for spontaneous order to show itself. All the beautiful 
uh, things that exist in the world from language to culture. I mean, natural selection itself are a result of spontaneous order. Again, human action, but not human design. And in some cases, not even uh, human action. So not designed from the top down. But the way we have evolved, that is hard to conceive. And therefore, it is desperately counterintuitive. And, uh, and that is, to some extent, you know, uh, Jefferson's famous saying that, uh, you know, liberty requires um, eternal vigilance. That is especially true because we are not hardwired to seek liberty in that sense. We are hardwired to seek order. And we are hardwired to imagine that order can only come in a top-down way with a strong man at the top. So a strong state is attractive for many people uh, for that reason. And therefore, uh, the, you know, the struggle of uh, people who know which way progress comes, uh, you know, despite all the evidence of history, people, you know, still don't uh, see that clearly enough because your intuitive ideas and the way your brain is wired in zero-sum ways and top-down order design ways, it, it, it's really hard to break across. So we just have to keep fighting it all. And it prevents you from taking risk because you've been cautioned against failure. And so you can't really let the creative destruction play out where, I mean, the creative is okay, but we're very uncomfortable with the destruction. I think risk aversion is a particular problem in India and it's it'll probably go away in a generation or two. Uh, because, you know, as they say, paradigms change a funeral at a time. It'll go away in a couple of generations, hopefully, when the people who are 20 today are 60 one day. It should be gone, I hope. But the reason society is largely like this is that, you know, times of scarcity, you generally never got a shot at success. And if you got a shot, that was the shot. You know, unless you're a part of the very thin sliver of rich elites, you know, going to Stephen's and doing school and all of that. But otherwise, it's, it's really hard. So you just want to grab what you can and then you just want to hold on to it. So I think that's where the risk aversion comes from. Uh, I see that sort of changing among young people. And I see that change also happening from young people in small cities and towns who are my biggest hope because they are not constrained by a conventional sense of what you can do or what they cannot do. And they're not constrained by that sense because sometimes they don't even know it. And at the same time, they're exposed to the world and they can see that in other countries, people take risks. They can see that there are success stories of people who failed 30 times before they made it the 31st time and changed the world. So I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful about that changing with time. And I'm especially hopeful because technology sort of enables individual autonomy and agency uh, in ways that no political movement ever could have. And you hope that, you know, people can do things, uh, do things more, fail faster, get up on their feet try again. I think that whole process can be accelerated depending on what exactly you're doing. And that gives me hope. Okay. On that optimistic note, thank you, Amit. Thank you.